Thanks for joining us today for this talk. I am very excited to extend a warm welcome to Chef Joanne Chang today. Thank you. So Joanne is an honors graduate of Harvard College with a degree in applied mathematics and economics. She left a career as a management consultant to enter the world of professional cooking. Before opening Flower, she honed her skills working at various restaurants, including the cake department at Payard in New York City, and was previously pastry chef at Rialto and Mistral here in Boston. In 2000, she opened Flower Bakery and Cafe in the South End. Since then, she's opened three other locations, including Fort Point Channel, Central Square, and Back Bay. In 2007, Joanne opened a Chinese restaurant in the South End called Myers and Chang with her husband, Christopher Myers. Flower has been featured in Gourmet, Food and Wine, Bon Appetit, and Boston Magazine, among other publications, and has received numerous Best of Boston awards. Also, you may have seen Joanne Prevail versus Bobby Flay in the Sticky Bun Throwdown, featured in the Food Network. And most recently, um, Joanne was awarded the 2013 Share Our Strength Chef of the Year Award for her involvement with the No Kid Hungry campaign. So congratulations, Joanne, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So you just released your new cookbook yesterday, actually, right? So you must be ramping up for a very busy month of book touring. Yes, uh, when the first book came out, and I actually did come here to Google, um, and you guys welcomed me just as warmly last time, so thank you. Uh, when the first book came out, I said to my publisher, so is there a book tour? And they said, no, we don't really do that anymore. Um, I think with bloggers and Food Network and all of that, they really were putting all of their energies and monies in uh, people who they knew would get a big audience. So they um, didn't book me anything, which is fine. Um, and then I did a lot of stuff locally, uh, and then I went to New York once. Um, this time around, I don't know what has changed. I've never really asked them what happened. I think the success of the, of the first book helped, um, and I think, uh, I'm not really sure actually. So this time, uh, the book came out yesterday, and um, I'm going to the West Coast, Toronto, uh, the Midwest, and Texas um, all in the next couple of months. So, wow. you know, day trips here and there, and then three or four day trips and taking advantage of being like out in the West Coast. So I'm pretty excited. I've never really traveled for the book, so I'm curious to see what it'll be like. Like when I come to Boston, most people know Flower, and it's easy for me to talk about it, and people have questions that are all relevant to what I do every day. So I'm very curious to see what happens when I go to a place where nobody's ever heard of Flower or me. And I'm hoping it's like not three people and me, but we'll see, we'll see. I think it'll be more, but I, and what's, I your, so. <laughs> what's your favorite city that you'll be going to? Oh, that's a good question. Well, we're going to San Francisco, which I'm really excited about. I don't get there very often, um, so I am excited to go there. Um, and then we're also going to, I'm going to Dallas, which is where my parents are, so I'm excited to be able to do that. Cool. Um, so I imagine you have a lot of fans that come out to see you. Clearly we have quite a few here at Google. Um, what is the oddest encounter you have had from a fan at one of these events? Oh boy. <laughs> I mean, there might be a, a weird encounter after this, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. If I'm describing you right now, um, I still think you're wonderful. I, so last night I was actually at Wellesley Books, uh, and when I came home, my husband said, so how was it? And I said, this was like the first book signing that I've done where there wasn't some crazy person like who came up to me. Um, every now and then there will be somebody who is extremely enthusiastic about either me or sticky buns or pastry. I mean, it, it could be anything. And I, I don't think it's personal to me. I think they just latched on to whatever it is about, you know, me or the book that has resonated with them. And usually at, um, at book signings that are kind of out in the world versus here where I feel like there's probably, hopefully nobody that crazy. Um, th there's always somebody who will stay at the very end and stay at the table and want to talk for about three hours. And I'm always trying to, you know, and I, of course I love talking to people who love flour. I love talking about baking and I could, I could talk for three hours about the book. So it's not that, you know, pe talkative people, you know, are weird. It's just sometimes there are fans who, um, who get a little bit too, intimate and want to know details and I know guys yeah and I'm just <laughs> I'm just not ever sure how to like how to graciously kind of back away from that um, I had one woman who basically followed me from book signing to book signing the first time around um, and every time at the very end she waited until everybody left 
and she spent a lot of time stroking my arm and <laughs> telling me how much she loved me. And um, I mean, she was very, very sweet. And it was one of those things where I just felt bad because I didn't know how to, it would be better if she were like really rude because then I could say, I don't want to deal with you, but um, she was so nice. So what do you do? You're too nice? I, I didn't know what to say. Just... <laughs> Try that next time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so why did you decide to come out with your second cookbook? You know, the second cookbook, um, after writing the first one, I definitely knew I wanted to write the second. I really loved the whole book writing process, but I, I thought that the second cookbook would be Myers and Chang, which is the Asian restaurant I own with my husband in the South End. Um, and in fact, I had already started testing recipes and was ready to write a proposal to send off to Chronicle. Um, and when the first book came out, immediately uh, readers were sending me you know, emails or tweets or Facebook posts or whatever saying, I really love the book, I'm making such and such, you know, what happened to this recipe? What happened to that recipe? And it hadn't occurred to me, I, I thought the first book was relatively complete um, until I started getting all of these inquiries and people were asking about the egg sandwich or the brown sugar oat muffin or um, the lemon ginger mousse or other things that we do at the bakery that I just, for whatever reason, had slipped my mind. So I started to get a number of these inquiries, and about the same time, my publisher, um, Chronicle, reached out and said, you know, we would like to do a second book with you. Um, I know you want to do Myers and Chang, but we actually think there's an there's a, um, opportunity with flour, with the second part of flour, basically the savory end. Um, and we originally had a savory chapter in the first flour book, but it got cut because it was too big. Um, but the book was too big, and so we took out that whole chapter. So I was already one up on you know chapters for the second this potential second book, and then I had this list of emails with literally probably 20 inquiries of different things um, that people wanted from Flower. So it became a natural next book, um, even though it wasn't what immediately came to my mind to do Flower two. And it sounds like there could be a third book coming out too. <laughs> well, again, I think the third book should be Myers and Chang, but my publisher has a different idea. Um, so I am signing a, a deal with them sometime this week um, to do a low sugar baking book, which um, is interesting. Um, I know that everyone's kind of like, wow, where'd that come from? I don't know where it came from. They, they again, they reached out to me. So, so this is how it works. My, the, the publisher of, okay, hold on, at Chronicle Books, the food cookbook publisher. She is married to a doctor who is colleagues with the guy who wrote sugar, the Sugar is Toxic article that was in the Times about six months ago. I don't know if you guys saw it, but it was a really interesting article. And for me, as somebody who lives implying sugar to others, it was you know a little bit nerve wracking to read that and think, oh gosh, what's going to happen now to my business? Um, it was the same fear I had you know, when we first opened Flower and Atkins diet was a big thing and, and no gluten and all that sort of stuff. So um, anyway, this uh, the editor, she called me and said, you know, we are really interested in thinking about what the future of baking might be because they spend a lot of time looking forward to trends. And so in order for them to come out with a gluten-free baking book today or a paleo baking book today, they have to know that it's something that's going to be popular like three or four years ago. So she's anticipating that low sugar will be something um, that will be interesting in, in three or four years, or two or three years. And so um, she asked me if I would be interested in considering it. Um, and you know, honestly for me, I thought, I, I read that article, The Sugar is Toxic, and I, I do know for myself, I eat a lot of sugar every day and I know how it makes me feel. Um, I get that sugar rush, I get really energized, and then I crash. Um, and I've just gotten used to it, it's just kind of what I do. But if I were trying to eat more healthily, or if I were raising a family, um, and if I was just trying to be more thoughtful about how I eat, then I would want to reduce my sugar. Um, and so I tested a bunch of recipes because I, I didn't want to say, yes, I'll do this book without knowing if it was even possible. Um, and I tested two really popular recipes from the first baking book, the banana bread and the oatmeal raisin cookie. And I was able to su successfully make both of them with either a third or half the amount of sugar that's listed in the book. And in fact, I made them for the bakers at the Flower South End location, um, and most of them preferred the new low sugar version to the current version. So to me, that was a really good sign um, that it, one, it can be done, and then two, that it would be fun. I really enjoyed the whole process. Um, baking is, you know, it's fun and creative um, when you get to do things like this. When you're doing things every day, it starts to get a little bit monotonous, and then you get thrown a challenge like this, and then you're kind of reminded of, of why you got into it in the first place. So that's the next book. Um, I did ask my publisher if I was allowed to talk about it, because at first we weren't going to gonna talk about it, and he said, yes, as long as we don't tell the publishing world. So 
I don't know if there's anybody in here. <laughs> It'll be on YouTube. So. <laughs> well, I think they don't want it like in Publishers Weekly. Yeah. What I'm assuming. All right. Well, we'll make sure it'll stay in this room, <laughs> in the bubble. Um, so, what is your favorite recipe from Flower Two? That's a good question. Um, gosh, favorite recipe. That's so hard. There, you know, uh, my favorite thing to eat from the Flower Two book would be the Queen Amon, which is the butter Breton cake, um, which is in the party time uh, section of the book. Um, I first had butter Breton cake. 15 or 20 years ago when I was in Paris. It was before we opened Flower, and I remember biting into it. It, it. it is basically a croissant that is made with extra butter and extra sugar, so that it becomes really, really crispy and caramelized on the edge, and then still flaky. It's, you know what, you know this whole thing with the cronut? I'm sure you guys all know about it. Um, it's sort of like that, it's got the same, it's got the same thing that the cronut has going for it. It's got the crunchy on the outside and the flaky on the inside. So when I first had it, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I remember thinking, if I ever open my own place, we're going to make Queen Amman. We opened flour, and I developed a recipe, but it was really difficult to make on a day-to-day -day basis, and so we offered it only at the holidays for 11 years. Then I started writing this book, and I wanted to put the recipe in the book. And I told my executive pastry chef, if it's in the book, we're going to have to offer it every day. So about a year ago, we started. We figured out how to... We figured out the production, and now we're offering it every day. So um, I, I would say that's probably one of my favorites. That sounds delicious. And I am a big fan of the cronut. <laughs> Add it yet. I, I want to go back in time a bit um, and have you think back to the first time you ever baked. What, when was that, and what did you bake? The first time I ever baked, I was probably 10. Let me think about this. Uh, no, actually, the first time, I think I was about seven. I remember this now. And it wasn't even baking, but for some reason I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make something with my friend, I can't remember his name, like Tim. We were little seven-year-olds, right? Um, and my parents both worked. Um, and I, I remember, because my mom got really mad afterwards, I crossed the freeway <laughs> so that I could get to the 7-Eleven to buy ingredients. And then we crossed the freeway back, um, and we made... Uh, this isn't really baking, but I assume this is kind of what you're going for. Um, we made little fruit kebabs, right? We bought you know whatever fruit you can buy over at 7-Eleven, and we cut it all up, and we, we put it on toothpicks, and then we put it in little baggies, and then we forgot about it for a day and brought it the next day to our teachers, at which point the bananas were all mushy and you know the, the apples were all yellowed. Um, but we were so proud. And I do remember you know, giving it to my teacher and just being really excited that I had made something um, and given it to her to, you know, because I loved her. Um, so it wasn't really baking, but that was like my first time in the kitchen. And I mean, was that kind of the beginning of what got you hooked? Or when was the you know, I've first always, moment? I've always loved to be in the kitchen. I mean, after that, I, I, I definitely spent time in the kitchen. Um, my mom was a working mom, and so I would come home from school, and she would often, you know, need help, basically just, you know, putting together dinner. And so um, I got to be pretty adept in helping her just prep stuff, so that by the time she got home, she could just, you know, you know, do a quick stir fry, or I would put stuff in the oven and get the rice ready, or whatever. Um, so I'd always been very comfortable in the kitchen. I think that the first time that I ever thought about it truly, um, I mean, I thought about it professionally very, very late. I mean, it wasn't until I was after college, but when I was in college, I did make um, chocolate chip cookies in the dormitory kitchen, and I sold them to the grill, the dormitory grill, and I sold them to the guys who ran the grill for 25 cents each, and they sold them three for a dollar, um, and I remember, and I did it for two years, junior and senior year, and I remember uh, each... I guess every semester they would write me a check for the proceeds and it was like 60 or $70 and I would use the money to go buy running shoes because I was a runner. And so uh, I, that was kind of my first foray into like making food that then people paid you for. Uh, but I certainly didn't think at that point, oh great, now I'm going to go and open a bakery. At that point it was just, it was a way to kind of kill some time. So you mentioned running shoes and I did read how you, you ran every single Boston Marathon from 91 to 2006. So is that your strategy, you know, run a marathon, eat 20 more stick <laughs> or... No, you know, I, I don't run as much anymore, um, which is unfortunate because I really do miss it. Uh, but I, I definitely think that, you know, when you're working all day in a kitchen and you're surrounded by food and you're eating food all day long, um, 
there's something that's just very relaxing and, and for me um, it's good for my mind to kind of go out and go for a long run and so uh, for years that's kind of how I that was like my thing I calmed myself down and it was like my little Zen thing I'm not like a speed runner I mean it took me like five or six hours each time so just plodding along um, but it was it's just something that definitely helps balance the, the amount of eating that you do all day long you're, you're a Harvard graduate and former management consultant turned chef restaurant owner. Um, so I come from a, you know, your stereotypical Asian household. So the first thing that I would like to know is what did your parents think when you quit your management consultant job? <laughs> you pastry chef? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so when it happened, it wasn't quite as black and white as that. I didn't say I'm quitting and dropping everything and going to do this. I was at the end of my second year as a management consultant, um, and that's typically, at the time, that's when people either went on to business school, or some people were staying within the company and they were gonna just kinda keep going up and up within the company. Um, and I didn't want either of those. I didn't wanna stay, and I definitely didn't wanna go to business school, and so I was kinda stuck, and I didn't know what to do next. And I'd always loved to cook and to bake, and so I thought, you know what, I'll take a year off, and I'll try cooking professionally and see if I can support myself for at least a year. Um, and then I'll figure out what I want to do. So that's kind of how I sold it to my parents. Um, I didn't have this plan that it was going to be a career change. It was just taking a year, a year off to do something that I enjoyed. And so I think that for them was a little bit easier to swallow than if I had said, I'm chucking the whole thing and I'm going to go become a chef. Um, and, you know, they were, they were cautiously supportive. I think they were definitely very nervous. Um, I was 24. And, you know, if you're 24, you don't really, you think you know everything, but if you're you know, 50, like my parents were, you think that the 24-year-old knows nothing. And so they were just really, really nervous. How are you going to support yourself? You're leaving this really stable job. It's got a lot of benefits. You're not going to have health insurance. You know, what are you going to do? So I think they were more concerned about logistically, how was I going to survive for a year? Um, and then when it became clear that it was more than just kind of a passing fancy, at that point, I think they saw how happy I was, and I was able to kind of make it work financially. Um, and and they so they were more accepting. And then as I got pastry chef jobs, it seemed even a little bit more legitimate in their eyes. And then when we opened the bakery, then it was a real thing. And so they were okay with it. And now they love it. Now they come all the time and they go to all the bakeries. Um, and in fact, they never, they will always uh, do kayak or whatever to find out what hotel they should stay in. And they always send, they'll send me an email and say, okay, this hotel, how far away is it from the bakeries? And I'm always like, mom, what about how far away is it from me? The one you're coming to visit? They will come for a week and I might see them three times because, but all the staff will see them dozens of times. Do you have any siblings? I do. I have a younger brother um, who went to MIT and studied uh, mechanical engineering, some sort of engineering, chemical, no, engineering of some sort. He's, he's brilliant um, and he worked for years for uh, Harris out in Las Vegas doing some of their something, something computer related. And then he just recently got moved to, he just recently took a job with Darden Corporation, which owns Olive Garden, Red Lobster, Capital Grill. Um, so he's te technically in the food business now, but he's still on the computer and he's assistant to the CFO or something. I don't really know. Sounds really smart. <laughs> he's very smart. He I just got his first patent. Um, I was very proud. You know, if you had simly, siblings, maybe you could deflect some of the attention in those early stages when you were trying to switch over if your younger brother was doing something else. Oh, he was, no, because at that point he was here at MIT, like getting his you know, mechanical engineering degree. I think <laughs> they were very proud of him, as they should have been. So you opened Flower back in 2000. Uh, what were your greatest challenges in those early days? Oh man, um, you know, something that I think I forget about, and I don't know if it's just one of those survival things that you do is, the, the entire first year of opening the bakery, I wanted to close it. Um, and in fact, I have a diary that I kept at the time, and there's an entry about this, the 10th month where I said, can't wait to sell this place. <laughs> mom says I should keep it at least a year. Um, I think I, ha you know, at that point I told my mom this isn't really working out, I don't really think this was a good idea, and my mom was just like, just keep it for a year, I think just to save face, to say that you at least did it for a year, and, and then you can sell it. Um, and, you know, the biggest challenges for me were that I had this vision of what I wanted 
the bakery to be. I had recipes, I had you know, in my head all these wonderful scenarios of customers coming in and getting you know, great friendly service and you know, the milk pitcher was full so you could put milk in your coffee and then you get your beautifully packaged pastry and go home and enjoy it. You, know, you, you think about that when you're planning a bakery. And then the reality is, is the customer comes in and the staff member is busy talking to their you know, co-staff member and the milk pitcher isn't full and they pack all the pastries smushed in a bag and you get the email from the customer saying, I ordered all these pastries and I spent this much money and you know, here's the picture of how my pastries look when I got home. And I, I, really, I really struggled with the, you know, taking the vision that I had and then trying to disseminate that amongst the staff and trying to impart upon them uh, the the goal that I was trying to do with flour um, and the missions that we were trying to do and it, that was the the hardest part you know for that whole first year is that I was only one person and I um, had a hard time and a, a really steep learning curve on learning how to delegate learning how to manage I'd been a manager you know at the various pastry chef jobs I'd had but that was very different and all of a sudden I had you know at the time it was 12 employees all of whom were great people. Um, I still keep in touch with many of them, but just had a different idea of what flour should be, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, that that constant struggle of walking in and seeing the place be so different from what I had intended and what I had worked so hard to create, um, and then going home and coming back and having the same thing happen every day. It's like. I kept trying to write the ship and I would go away for, you know, 15 minutes and the ship would go off that way and then I'd come back and write it and then it would go off again. Um, and on top of that, in the whole first year, well, I didn't take a day, I didn't take a day off until t about 10 months in um, and then I was, I was doing all of the baking. So that was coming in at 3 in the morning um, and doing the bake off and then staying there all day long and then I was also, again, because I was a small business, I was doing all of the, you know, accounting, all of the payroll, all of that back office stuff. So that was happening late at night and then I'd go to bed and wake up again and do the whole thing over starting at three. So, you know, a couple months in or however long, you just start to get really exhausted and when the milk pitcher isn't filled, it just seems like, okay, this isn't worth it. I should sell the place. <laughs> and so when did it start to turn and you know, pick up? Definitely in that, between that 10th month and that first year where I was, where I had vowed to sell it. Um, the, the, the key where it started to turn was I finally, had staff that I trusted. Um, and not that they previously they I didn't trust them, they were all very trustworthy, but I meant I finally had staff that could do what I did in the way that I wanted them. And so for me, um, the, the big thing was opening. It is being the first person to turn on the ovens, to take all the pastries that are ready to go, to put them in the ovens, to mix the batters, and get everything ready so that by 7 a.m. you can have the pastry display ready for guests when they come in. Um, Around the 10th month, I trained uh, somebody who's still with me. She's my executive pastry chef. She's been made partner. Um, and Nicole learned how to open, and that gave me a breather. It gave me one day that I could actually sleep in to probably 5 in the morning, you know. But it was just something that kind of gave me a little bit of perspective. It's just so hard when you're just doing it day in, day in, day in, day out. Um, and so having that person who could share a little bit of the responsibility um, was was key and then from that came a front of a house manager who you know once we when we opened we had a front of house manager but he didn't end up working out so then we didn't have one for a long time and you'd by about the end of the first year we'd hired somebody who was really terrific so then she could do all of the hiring and training of the counter staff so it was it was simply you know the, the key was just getting a team around me that understood what we were trying to do and once I felt that they understood then the mistakes became not irrelevant, but they didn't bother me as much. It's like, okay, we all make mistakes, right? And so they would make a mistake, and it's like, that's okay, because I knew they wanted to do the right thing. It was in the beginning when nobody knew what I was trying to do, that when mistakes were, make, were made, they didn't understand. It was just this constant struggle. Um, so I think a lot of folks in this room have a similar entrepreneurial spirit, and you may strive to launch their own business someday. What advice would you give to budding entrepreneurs? For, for me, definitely, it's about creating and developing a team of people that surround you and who believe in what you do. Because, I mean, I remember in that first year just thinking, man, did I do this wrong? I should have gotten a little kiosk that was just manned by me 
and with a little like commissary kitchen where I would be the only one baking and then the only one selling and then the only one washing dishes because I was feeling like I'm the only one who can do this right. Um, and so for people who want to start their own businesses, unless you're a one man show, you need to rely on other people. And so the, the biggest advice that I tell anybody, um, usually people come up to me and they say, I want to open a bakery, you know, what do I do? And I mean, it is, it is creating those relationships around you and developing people around you who understand what you're trying to do and who believe in it and who can help you get to where you're trying to go because you really can't do anything by yourself. Um, when I was planning for the bakery, I was in New York City working at Pyard, and at the end of my stint at Pyard, I spent um, about three or four weeks with Amy Sherber of Amy's Breads. Um, she was very generous and said, yep, you can come and hang out with us for a month and learn what you want to learn about bread. And I, and, and I asked her, like, in exchange for my working for a month, can I pick your brain for an hour or so? So at the end of my month there, I asked her the same question. I'm like, I want to go open my business. What would you, what, what do I need to know? And she said, human resources. You need to find people. You need to find people. You need to find people. Um, and sure enough, the very next day, so I had ended my internship. My mom came to New York to pick me up. I was, had like two days in New York with my mom. Um, and the very next day after my goodbye interview with Amy, she called me the next morning and said, is there any way you can do the whatever, whatever shift because so-and-so just walked out. And I couldn't because my mom was there with me and we were getting ready to leave, but it just really hammered home that man, without people, you know, you can't do that much. Um, you can have a great idea, you can personally be a great baker, you can be a great salesman, but unless you're willing to do every single thing on your own, you're not gonna su succeed. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, so, so here at Google, we are always trying to innovate and stay ahead of the curve. As a chef, how do you innovate? That's a great question um, because we have challenges in that area uh, in that for us, people who come to the bakery, I mean, I think at a certain point you have to just decide what is your audience and what are you trying to do and to be true to what you want to do. So we try to innovate, we try to add new sandwiches, we try to change things up. Um, we are physically limited by what we can produce to a set number, of, you know, rough number of things. So we can't just constantly add things. If we add something, we have to take something away. Um, and what we have found over the years that it's really, especially as flour has gotten bigger and people associate us with certain things, it's really difficult for us to innovate without pissing off a lot of people. We tried last summer, to change the turkey sandwich. I don't know if any of you guys are turkey sandwich aficionados, but my gosh, you would have thought I like stole people's first child. I got so <laughs> many emails like, what did you do? Why did you do this? What is wrong? And, you know, and to, for every person who was upset, we probably got 10, you know, what's wrong with you to one, we really like the new sandwich. So we, we stuck it out for, I think, six or eight months, and then I was continuing to get the emails, and finally we just said, okay, let's just switch back. So it's hard for us to try to come up with new products. But in terms of innovating, in terms of how we run our business, we are constantly trying to think of ways. Um, you guys are an inspiration. Um, what you guys do within the company to try to create good working environments and to foster creativity. It's all stuff that, you know, I read all the articles about Google and I think, ah, oh, what can we do from that um, to help inspire the staff who work for me? I mean, we have a very different group of employees. A lot of them are, it's, uh, their, it's their part-time job because they're in school or, you know, they've taken a year off from, from something and then they're moving on. So there's a, definitely a different environment, um, but there's still the same capacity to inspire people to take that moment that they're working for us at Flower and be the best Flower person they can. So for us, we try to innovate in terms of how do we energize them and get them excited and make them understand that even though this is only your part-time job and you're only here for three months, it's still really important for us that you view this as if this is your life goal to be the best you know, counter person or baker you can. Um, and so we spend a lot of time thinking about how, and we brainstorm a lot um, and we just think about you know, what we can do, what we can offer to the staff to, to give them that environment. Um, how did you decide on the name Flower Bakery? Flower came from my husband. Um, I was in New York and I called him and we weren't dating at the time, he was just a friend. And I called him and I said, I'm thinking of coming back to Boston. I wanna open my own bakery. Do you have any ideas? And he came up with a list of names, um, none of which I can really remember. Uh, Flower was one of them. And I remember thinking, that doesn't work. You know, there's a list of them. And I, I, I thought, that doesn't work, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. 
Um, none of them worked, basically. And then I think like a week or so later, I was just looking at the list again, and I was playing around with the word flower. It just seemed weird. Like, why would you name a bakery flower? It just sounded so plain and uninspired. Um, I don't know. And then it kind of grew on me. And then I thought, it's like anybody's you know, first name. It, if, it, if you have an unusual first name, it sounds weird to people until they get to know you. And after the fifth time, it just becomes your name. So for me, flower was the same. Flower sounded weird. And then after thinking about it, um, I thought, OK, this could work. And now it just seems like a no-brainer. Um, and I'm very grateful for him for coming up with it. Sounds like he inceptioned you or hypnotized you in some way. <laughs> <laughs> that might have happened. <laughs> you mentioned in the early days you, you were waking up at 3 a.m. What is a typical day like for you today? Mm. Totally different. Um, so typically, I mean, if it weren't for the book, so typically I try to go to two flower locations a day. Um, morning at one, afternoon at the other, and then three or four times a week I try to go to the restaurant in the evening. Um, and then what I'm doing now is a little bit of what I was talking about earlier, the, the innovation with the, the staff, which for me really is getting to know the staff. And so I come in and I taste products and I talk to everybody and I just try to get a sense of, you know, they're in the middle of their day. They're either serving coffee or they're baking off cookies or they're, you know, making soup or something. So I try not to interrupt their day, but I do try to find good times within the morning that I'm there to stand next to this, you know, s certain staff people and just talk to them and just find out, you know, what they're doing and how's this working and, hey, we just got this new piece of equipment, what do you think? Or in the front of the house, wow, we just got this new iced tea, how's it selling? Um, so I s spend a fair amount of time just trying to, to actually just connect with the staff because we have so many people and I feel, I feel like if I don't stay connected with them, I'll forget. Not that I'll forget what Flower is all about, but I, I will forget that connection of the staff to the customer. And so it's really important for me to stay close to them. Um, and then I spend a lot of time in the office doing um, just like either managerial stuff. We have a lot of manager meetings. Each location has its own manager meeting that I attend. And then I have manager meeting with my director of operations and with my executive pastry chef and with my human resource director. So there's a lot of meetings. And then from the meetings, I spend a lot of time in front of the computer summarizing the meetings and doing follow-ups of the meetings. And then, so it's just like a lot of like office work. Sounds like a lot, like Google, you could be here. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so from the sound of it, it seems like you probably don't get a chance to cook at home very much. I don't, I miss that a lot. In fact, where was I? Oh, I was just driving down, um, I don't know the name of the street, but in downtown where there's a grocery store where I used to go all the time, and I was just driving down there last week, and I thought, man, I haven't been to that grocery store in, and then I started counting, and I said, six years since we opened Myers and Chang. There's really no reason for me to cook. Um, I mean, I enjoy it, but it's so easy just to go to the restaurant and get takeout and bring it home, so we do a lot of that. <laughs> and, and so you must be an expert, on, obviously, on all the dishes at Myers and Chang oh, yeah. with the takeout, so what do you usually take out? Uh, let's see. We get the salmon. It's a pan roasted soy glazed salmon. Um, it's very, very simple. It's definitely not the dish that I recommend when I'm trying to like show off about what Myers and Chang is all about, but it's my favorite dish. It's just really simple and delicious. Um, we get the lamb belly. It's a lamb belly stir fry with slippery glass noodles um, and leeks and uh, sesame seeds. Um, the salmon and apple tartare, spicy salmon and apple tartare with sesame crisps is one of my favorite. Um, we always get a vegetable. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, so I want to leave a little time for audience questions, but just a few last fun questions before we finish up. Uh, what would be your last meal? <laughs> uh, my last meal, I would have. Um, huh. I love. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I would do lots of things. Um, <laughs> cheating. <laughs> oh, really? Is that really cheating? Well, it's okay. Last meal, go, go so you it. could like yeah. eat everything. <laughs> go big or go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't think of like a composed last meal. I would, I would probably go to Oishi and have, you know, omakase, and then I would save a little room and I would go to Pico and have a pizza, and then I would go to like the 7-Eleven and buy Haagen Dazs coffee ice cream and eat the whole thing. <laughs> That is a healthy meal. <laughs> what is on your music playlist? This is sad. I don't listen to music. In fact, last night driving out to Wellesley, I thought I should turn on the radio just to see what are people listening to these days. <laughs> I don't even know what playlist means. Um, I don't know what, it, I, I don't listen at all. I used to listen to 
um, a hip hop station, pop station, Kiss 108, because I used to run to headphones, and then my headphones got stolen like three years ago, so that, and I just stopped listening. Um, when I'm listening, if I were to ever listen, um, I actually, at this point, now I feel like like I've gotten old, but I really do like classical music because my, my dad loves classical. So there's a lot of fond memories, you know, listening when I listen to certain things. So I have a couple CDs that I'll stick in the thing, whatever it is, but, but I'm not really a music person. It sounds like we need to work on getting you headphones. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do for fun? Um, so I love, uh, I mean, I love going out to eat with Christopher and, you know, friends. I mean, that's definitely something that I enjoy a lot and look forward to when we can schedule it in. Um, I still run and exercise every day, which might sound like not fun, but for me it's very fun. Um, I love to read. Uh, I, I don't have enough time to just sit and relax, and so like my ideal is like on Sunday mornings to wake up and have breakfast with Christopher and then just read the paper just slowly over the course of the day. Um, yeah, those are the three things that I like to do. I like to shop, but I don't spend a lot of time shopping. Um, and last question. Um, I noticed the flower motto is make life sweeter, eat dessert first. So do you really eat dessert first? Well, I'm kind of eating a dessert all day long. So it's, you know, by the time I get to dinner, I actually feel like I need to eat some food. I'm very conscious of the fact that I don't eat real food usually until dinner time. Um, but if I were not, you know, on days that I'm not at the bakery, um, I, I think it's important to, to eat dessert first because you might not have room. I've had plenty of, of dinners where I run out of room by the end of dinner. So if I can, I try to sneak it in. It's a little odd. Well, sometimes, strategy. sometimes the servers are like, are you sure? Um, but we've seen customers at Myers and Chang do that. They'll order you know, the, the nasi goreng and the arctic char roll and a coconut cream pie. And I'm always like, are you sure? And they're like, yeah, we want to eat dessert as well. So. Well, now I want to open it up to audience questions. So if anybody has any questions, you guys can line up here so we can get you on the mic. Don't be shy. I'll come up. Yeah. Do I really have to go? Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> I'm just curious. So now you're in four um, locations around Boston. How connected are you to the communities and the other restaurant owners and bakery owners? And do you guys help each other out and, and, and stay in touch? The restaurant and bakery community in Boston and Cambridge is extremely tight-knit. Um, everybody knows everybody. Everybody sees everybody at events and goes to everybody's restaurants. Um, so yes, we're very connected. I feel very connected. Um, in fact, we're looking for a sous chef uh, position at Myers and Chang, and I just this morning sent an email out to all of my chef friends, and just saying if you know of anybody or if there's anybody on your team that you can't, you know, is ready to move on, and you don't need them, you know, send them our way. Um, so we all feel very connected. You know, I, I will reach out to Mora at Sofra on a periodic basis, or vice versa. You know, if she needs something or if I need something for advice. Um, the woman who runs Tati Bakery, um, her pastry chef used to work for me as my pastry chef, and so Kristen and I stay in touch. Um, and then just all the chefs, they just all know each other. You know, we, we, we all work really well together. So I was just wondering, I like to test around the kitchen as well quite a bit, but I never actually remember the recipes. So I didn't know if when you go into testing a new recipe, do you take down the measurements or kind of what's your process for doing that so you can remember it again? I, I definitely write it down first. So one of the things I tell people when I'm doing a demo, for example, is, um, you know, like when you're watching on food TV and they have all the little cups with everything all measured out and then they go boom, boom, boom and it's done. Um, that's actually how I, I bake. And so if I'm testing a recipe, like right now I'm in the middle of this slow sugar thing, I write down a recipe that in my head I think will work and then I go and I measure everything out um, and then I have my piece of paper with a pen next to me and as I'm baking, if I see an adjustment, you know, I'll add a cup of milk and realize, ooh, it needs more liquid, then I'll add it and I'll measure another quarter and then I'll change the recipe. So for me, um, it's not something, it's not like cooking where you can kind of, and, and because I need to replicate it, if I'm just cooking at home, I wouldn't think so much about it, but because I need to replicate it, I have to be really careful about taking really detailed notes. So it's, it's a little bit, um, you know, it can be a little bit less fun because you're trying to just make something delicious and then, oh shoot, I gotta remember to write this down. But I've gotten used to it over testing the two books these past couple of years. So um, it's definitely the best way in order to be able to replicate it going forward. So you have 
uh, a few successful businesses that you've started. You've written a couple of books. Um, at this point, you said that you make it into some of your businesses some of the time, depending on you know what you can fit in the schedule. Um, so they're obviously sustaining themselves in ways that was not possible at the beginning. Um, how self-sustaining are your businesses, and what's next for you, given that you've been able to free up some of the time in your schedule? Sure. The businesses at this point, if I were to just drop off the face of the earth, um, there's a couple things that's, that I do that I'm still the only one who does. Um, I mean, it's, it, but it wouldn't be hard to teach somebody. So for example, payroll, which happens every other week. Um, I have an HR person, she runs payroll. Um, you know, she talks to all the managers to make sure everybody's uh, time clocks are correct. But I physically enter it into our accounting system because I wanna see how much we're paying everybody. But that's not, I mean, that's easy enough to just, tr if I were to you know, move to Tahiti, I could just teach her how to do that part and she could do it. Um, you know, honestly, I think that's like the only thing that I, do that I have to, I mean I and I field a lot of the emails so we get a lot of emails from uh, you know either complaints or requests for information and and I tend to answer mo or charity requests and I tend to answer most of them um, especially the complaint ones just because they are important to me and I need to I want to stay on top of them all um, so but that again could I could also easily give that to my director of operations he would gladly do all of that for me I think what would be missing, um, and it's one of the reasons why I don't want to not be at the bakeries as much as I can, is the connection that I have with the staff, trying to make them understand like the story of flour. And you know, we're at this point where people, some people call us a chain, um, and I, I don't want it ever to feel like that. And I imagine, you know, we were talking earlier about how Google's gotten really big, and I'm, I'm sure that whoever the big people are like wish it were still small and so trying to create that maintain that small company atmosphere even though it's it's gotten bigger um, is something that I think I'm uniquely positioned to do simply because I don't have a job title you know my my executive pastry chef she's in charge of pastries so she spends all her time actually like working on pastries and HR person she does HR but for me I'm just owner so what do I do I I try to make sure that the place that they are working at is what I intended it to be, because I think it's very easy without guidance for it to just kind of, like, like I was saying earlier, just veer off. And not necessarily in a bad way, but just in a way that's not what I intended. And so it's not that my way is the right way, but I think there's something to be said for running a business that has a, a clear vision. And if there's not one person or one, you know, whatever group of people that's kind of setting the vision on a daily basis and having that be their focus, I think it's easy for companies to kind of lose their way. And so, I don't know if that really answers your question. I mean, it's not like a like a specific job thing that I do conscious. I mean, I, I do it consciously, but there's not like a list of things that I do to do that. It's just kind of how I try to stay connected to the various bakeries. And what's next? Oh, and what's next? So, um, I mean, writing the second book, or the, the third book, and then at the, after that, the Myers and Chang book, um, definitely. <laughs> no, at this time I made, I made Bill my publisher. I, I made him commit to this. I said, okay, so I'll do this one. And then, and he actually had a good point. He said that with the timing of it, uh, if I do the Myers and Chang book, it will come out at Myers and Chang's 10th anniversary, which seems to make sense and works and is, feels good and all that. So. Um, you know, and after that, I don't, I honestly don't know. I've never been one to have a clear, even though I'm talking about how you have to have a clear vision, I haven't had a clear path about what I want to do next. And do I want to, I don't want to open more bakeries, but I feel like I have to be careful when I say that because I'm pretty sure when I came here last time, when we only had the three bakeries, I probably said the same thing, and yet we opened a fourth. Um, but what's stopping us this time from opening a fifth is that physically we are limited with how we're doing our production. If we were to open a fifth, we would have to build a commissary kitchen, which we don't have now. And so that, for me, if we were to go that route, that's a huge big next step. That, that just changes the business model. Because right now I can still, in my head, convince myself that I just have four little bakeries. But once you go commissary, then you become commissary. So. Uh, connection to my question excuse me, is how do you define yourself, I didn't come from the beginning so I might have missed something you said, but how do you define yourself compared to the other bakeries in the area? You know, Ikki's obviously has a different business model, sure. but the product has a lot of similarities um, high rise or as we 
book is called High Price, um, which applies to all of you. But uh, <laughs> how, how do you find yourself compared to the, the other bakeries? One thing that we try to do um, is we try to spend a lot of time just staying focused on what we do and not spend a lot of time looking at what the others do and how we relate vis-a-vis -vis them. And so, you know, when I started Flower 13 years ago, it was all about, um, it, was a, it, it was a couple of things. It was, you know, from a food point of view, making sure that that was always a priority, which, you know, it's, it sounds obvious, you're opening a food business, so of course food should be obvious, but it's very easy um, for a food business after a certain number of years to just kind of go on automatic. And so we spend a lot of time really working on, even though the menu doesn't change much, we are constantly trying to tweak the recipes and make them a little bit better or figure out how to do it a little bit differently so that we're interested but the customers don't get upset that we've changed something. Um, and then again, part of my kind of mission statement 13 years ago was trying to create an environment that as a customer, when you walk in, you feel like, I mean, it's cheesy, but um, I always say it's like Shears. It's a home away from home, and that's what I want Flower to be. I want Flower to be a place where people in the neighborhood come to the to the bakery and feel like it's their place. Um, and in the South End, for example, where, where we that's the first one, we have a ton of regulars who we know on a very personal level, and they come in, and it is their bakery. They tell us what to change. They clean up for us. You know, it's it's become like a really nice community. And obviously, people flit in and flit out, but. For me, that's something that kind of, I don't even know if it sets us apart because I don't know what the other bakeries are trying to do, but I think all of the bakeries around us, um, I mean, Iggy's to me, I love Iggy's, but to me, they're wholesale, and I know they have the little outpost, I think, on Fawcett. Every Sunday. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> no, no, that's where, where I go every Sunday. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, I think they're great, but they're they're focusing on wholesale, so which is different. That's what I say about the business model. Yeah. I think the closest to us um, at this point I mean, High Rise is very similar and to us, to what we do. Um, but he doesn't do like the fancy cakes, you know, and, and so we have that focus. Um, and then Tati Bakery, I feel like recently has become similar to what we do. Um, Bread and Butter, which just opened up in the North End is, I haven't been yet, but I think it's similar to what we do. I think there's enough out there, you know, enough people out there to kind of be able to, to have numerous bakeries and just each place be a little bit different just based on their own personalities. I mean, again, I'm not trying to define myself vis-a-vis -vis them, I just try to define myself vis-a-vis -vis what I'm trying to do. And, you know, to the earlier question about what would happen if I were to move or stop being uh, involved every day, I feel like that's what I'm always doing, is just trying to set the the tone of the place and, and the spirit so that when you walk in, it is clear that it's flour and not just one of the various bakeries that you can walk into. I think we have time for one more question. So from the new cookbook, what one recipe would you say, oh, you've got to try this one? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the book is, is divided into breakfast, lunch, dinner, party, drinks. And so that's, I guess, give me a category and then I'll tell you. <laughs> Okay, party time. Um, I would say, okay, this isn't my answer, but I'm just gonna sh throw it out there because we have samples. The spectacular spice pecans, which don't look like much and um, aren't like a, like a sexy treat to bring to an event like this. The reason why we brought them is that we did a book launch party with this a couple weeks ago um, and had like this open house with snacks from the book. And it was the one, the, the spice pecans are the one thing that everyone wrote about and said to me, oh my God, I love this. Um, but if you were to make one thing from that, I would say, hmm, I would say either, I know I'm hedging here, either the Petivier or the Croquembouche, um, simply because I think they're both really dramatic and really beautiful. Um, I mean, they're both delicious, uh, and I think they're the type of dessert that if you, if you want a project and you want to do something that's going to impress, um, I think those two would do the trick. They're both desserts that we only offer at Christmas time. Um, and I spent a lot of time, you know, working on the recipe to make it accessible to people. So they were a little bit long, but if you follow the recipe step by step, you'll get this glorious dessert that you can present to friends and it's pretty impressive. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, Joanne, for thank coming. You. Thank you so much.